G'day. Good morning. No, I'm not giving you a speech about uh, language and technology. We have our fantastic Dr. Karen Woodman here for that. Now, uh, I see some familiar faces. Uh, you've been here enjoying the talks. Hasn't she been wonderful? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we have a few more left before you all get off the ship. So please, would you help me welcome her back out to the stage once more, Dr. Karen Woodman. Thank you very much. Hey, my regulars. <laughs> Technically, this is actually my last talk, so there we go. <laughs> I'm getting off in Sydney. So how is everybody today? Yay! All ready to learn about language learning and technology? So how many of you have uh, tried to learn another language? Unsuccessfully? <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I mentioned in the last talk, we are talking a little bit about the conditions for good language learning. Uh, I, I touch on this a little bit um, in, in this talk uh, as well, because one of the things that technologies can give you is an opportunity to learn in your best way, because there is no particular one way that people learn languages best. Every, you know, one of the things that we always tell our, you know, students and parents is that every child is unique. Well, every learner is unique. So the way one person learns is not the way another person learns. And a lot, for a lot of people, learning in classrooms is not their best way to learn. So I, I'm guessing a lot of the people who put their hands up as uh, less successful language learners probably learnt it in a school classroom. Would I be correct in that? Yeah. Um, so classrooms, as I mentioned the other day, I mean, learning in classrooms can be good because it can accelerate the learning in the sense that you get more structured in, uh, information. But, you know, there are also language teaching practices that, you know, should have disappeared with Latin because that's actually how they were, what they were based on. You know, that whole, whole memorizing lists of verbs and stuff? That works for Latin. Really, by the way, doesn't work for English. <laughs> um, but when people were learning Latin, they were learning it as an exercise, not to actually speak it. So a lot of the types of techniques that are used in classrooms are, are very outdated. And they don't take into consideration, for those of you who've been at mo a lot of my talks, the 70 to 80% of language competence, which is not about the individual words. So how long have we been using technologies in language learning? How long have we been learning languages? Because technically, a pencil is also a uh, is, is actually a technology. Um, how many of you have used any have uh, used apps or tried using some of the apps or, or other things like that? It, one of the things, one of the sort of advances that have happened in the last few years is as we went from you know some of you, if you remember back, say in the, in the 90s and that language learning was very much a, it was a static interaction with a computer, like fill in the blanks. Then we got internet-based, which were slightly more interactive depending on who created them. Um, and now we have apps like Duolingo, which has brought what we call gamification into the process, which is basically making it fun. Learning languages should be fun. It should not be painful. <laughs> it should not be punishment. Um, the other change uh, in, in the whole language learning field is around the, around what we call edu-tourism, which is education tourism. So being able to recreate the more or less natural use of the language can make it more interesting, but also more interactive. How many of you like to learn by listening? How many of you like to learn by reading? How many of you like to learn by doing? Yeah, yes, <laughs> just, just for the record. Th the majority of them did that. So one of the things about technologies is technologies can help simulate an actual learning or actual language context. How many of you use Zoom over the last couple of years? Now, effectively, I mean, Zoom is a technology, but it's basically just video calling, right? So you can now, for example, learn languages through Zoom because Really, the only difference is the person's not physically in the room with you. Uh, and, and I'm aware of both of the negatives and positives of Zoom. It's, it's like with PowerPoint. They can be used for good or evil. It's just a technology. 
So any of you who got caught in Zoom, Zoom meetings during the last couple of years, it's like Zoom is, it's not, the, it's not the technology, it's how we use it. So one of the things that Skype and, and Zoom allow us to do is, is interact ongoingly with, for example, a tutor in your, class, in, in, in your home. You know, the nice thing about technologies is that they can bring the learning to you wherever that is. Uh, and even things like a lot of what I'll be talking about, and I do actually have a PowerPoint, I'll get, <laughs> get, back, get around to that in a second. But, um, the, the trick is, for example, for the people who like to listen, podcasts, listening to audiobooks. You know, basically the, 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 the focus is taking something you enjoy doing anyway and then using it in some way to engage with the target language, whatever the target language is, and also the purpose of the target language. So, for example, if you were somebody who wanted to learn Italian because you like opera, what might be a good thing to do to practice your Italian? Listen to opera, do I hear? Yes. <laughs> um, the reason I mention that is often in classrooms, in language classrooms, they're trying to teach everything all at once. But, for example, if you want to learn Spanish because you're going to go to Mexico for two weeks, do you really need to be able to read at a university level? No. If you want to go to France and do a wine tour, believe it or not, there are actually edutourism courses where you can do that and learn French at the same time. And we do know that a little bit of alcohol helps you not only be perceived as more uh, fluent, but actually be a little bit more fluent. Uh, obviously, there's a, a limit. <laughs> After a certain point, you think you're very fluent and you're completely incoherent. But um, So this is where the edutourism aspect comes. Um, I think I mentioned maybe on the very first day that when I, that my, my second or third language is, uh, is Spanish. I went to Argentina in 2009 to do a Spanish and tango program. Spanish in the morning, tango in the afternoon. And these are what I'm talking about in terms of edutourism. So if you're a dancer, is Chris still hanging around back there? Um, you can do Spanish and salsa, Spanish tango, Austrian, um, German, and uh, Viennese waltz. You name it, you can do a course on it. Now, some of you probably aren't dancers yet. Um, how many people like to cook? How many people like to eat? Yeah, you're on a cruise. So. The, the, the examples that I gave, for example, you know, learning Italian while well, traveling through Tuscany and learning how to make pasta. These are, I'm not making these up, they exist. <laughs> um, actually, a lot of cruises now have these kind of experiential cultural events, but they really are, la they are language learning. So it's, you know, there are even ones, any golfers in the audience? There are golf language programs where you learn, the, you're in the country, you're learning the language, and you get to play golf. So, you know, for most of the people, or for a lot of the people in the audience, you know, you're not really learning, you're not learning it for grades anymore. I'm, I'm not making a complete, uh, some, some of you will have been grade driven through your whole life, so you are looking for the gold star, gotcha. Um, but it's about finding something that you enjoy doing. If you, you know, flower arranging. Um, when I used to live in Victoria, BC, there was a, uh, a, a group of Japanese uh, florists who would come to Victoria every year and learn how to, you know, the, the hanging baskets that they have in Victoria, the f they're very quite famous. They actually did those. So they would learn to do it, and then of course they'd also in that case be practicing English. So it's, it's about finding something that you like to do. It doesn't have to be punishment. So, no, the, the, the subtitle here is because cu computers never get bored. That's actually important for language because everybody has something that they might find difficult in a language. For me, in Spanish, it's ref reflexivos, which, by the way, I have given up learning. Just saying. So, the great thing about using technologies, which are usually computer-based, is that if you have to listen to it 5,000 times, the computer doesn't care. Computer doesn't judge, either. <laughs> so. What's great, particularly for people, a lot of people who are sort of more on the introvert s spectrum aspect of who don't like to be out talking unless they know what they're doing, you can practice this at home and the computer doesn't judge. And the computer doesn't care how many times you have to do it. So this is also good for, you know, if you have, you know, children or grandchildren who, who have the, computers are great because they don't judge and if you have to, you know, you can find that one little thing in the language that you need practice with and you can do it 
however many times you want. So what are new technologies? Well, basically, it can talk about new te old technologies that are used in new ways. For example, desktop uh, computers, laptops, tablets, video games, and in, on the, you know, the internet. If you try Googling, you know, Spanish, uh, learning Spanish game, you know, learning Spanish games, you'll find like millions of websites. Not all of them are good, but there are literally millions of language learning sites. Um, also using new devices in new ways. So, you know, most people have smartphones. Some of you have dumb phones, but most of you have smartphones. Um, <laughs> no, I, I've seen them. <laughs> a, uh, the, the, old, the, old, the, old, the old school version that, that pretty much just use, are used for phone calls. Um, the nice thing about mobiles of any kind or cell phones, I'm bilingual, is that they're with you all the time. So things on mobiles are great for practicing. So you're, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting for, for the, your shore excursion or you're, you know, on a bus or you have some downtime before dinner. And you pull it out and you do like flashcards. How, how many of you have learned with flashcards in the past or subjected your children to them? Yeah. Um, there are, you can create your own, there are apps to create your own flashcards. And if those are ways, if that's something that's a, a particular method that helps, that works for you, you know, there are ones that actually have flashcards in any language you could possibly want. Um, and you can also create your own. How many of you, uh, I know there's a lot of people who do crosswords here, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you can create your own crosswords. There are also crosswords in target languages. Um, one of the things that I, I use sometimes is, you know, the, the, the word search type things? You can also find those um, online in apps. So it's practicing, but it's practicing it doing something that you actually already enjoy doing. The other thing that's really important when you're trying to learn a language is figuring out what it is that you need to learn. Uh, if you're here, we're talking about the difference between children and adults in terms of what you have to learn. Uh, you know, you can pretty much say it would be impossible to know everything about another language because you're still learning your mother tongue. So what you want to figure out is what, what type, what parts of the language do I need? So again, if you're just going for a short period for tourism, uh, speaking and listening and a little bit of reading is probably good. The other thing is, of course, we now have apps that can, for example, read signs. So it, it's, it is getting to the point where you're, there's a lot of things that your, com your phone can do in terms of survival language um, that can you know, influence how much of the language do you want to learn. Now, a lot of people, mo actually almost everybody learns a second language because there's something that interests them in that culture. Um, some people learn it for work. Uh, I had one gentleman on a previous cruise who learned it for love. Um, he met, uh, uh, when he was in Thailand, he met a, a woman uh, and it, he wanted to be able to talk to her family, particularly getting permission from her dad, so he learned Thai. And as he said at that point, they were, had been happily married for 35 years, so that one worked. Um, so knowing, like if you're doing business, that's a different level of language. If you're going to be a diplomat, that's a different level of language. Uh, if you're just traveling around, that's, again, a different level. So knowing what language, so for example, tourism survival language is different than academic language. So figuring out what do you need. So for example, for Spanish, for me in Argentina, it was what, we call, what I would call milonga Spanish. It was, and actually not Spanish, Castellano, because it was Argentinian. And I do apologize for anybody who's still recovering from the Socceroos. <laughs> in their defense, in Argentina, it really is a religion, so. Um, but that's basically the language that you needed for the dances, for the social interactions in the dances. I, I didn't need to have to particularly know how to read um, or write, but I needed to know not only the language, but the social context, being able to understand how to use Spanish in this very specific context. So you've got apps, um, websites. How many of you have learned something through YouTube? <laughs> Most people, how many of you have watched YouTube videos? Yeah, so one of the great things about YouTube is that, it, you know, basically you can learn anything you ever could ever possibly want on YouTube. This is also true of languages. So YouTube can be your teacher in your pocket. You know, be, and before anybody comes up, well, who's the best person to teach? I don't know. You need to do a little research on your own and find out which of those people who are teaching whatever language you're interested in 
do you like? Do you like their style? Do you like the content? Um, because, again, pretty much any language you could possibly think about, there is somebody teaching it. Sometimes it costs money, sometimes it's free. Usually you can find it for free. So I'm, I'm usually dubious for ones where they actually make you pay money. Uh, newspapers. If you like to, how many of you like to write, read newspapers? And you still do it online. Like my, my, uh, I, I have the Guardian app, so that's my newspaper for the day. If you're a newspaper reader, and not everybody is, finding the newspaper in that, uh, finding a newspaper app or website that you like in that language, because then you're getting useful information. One of the problems with textbooks is textbooks are actually, first off, they're out of date because it takes at least two to three years to get one published. But also, they're very generic, and that's a business decision. Um, you know, they have to be ge generic because they have to sell in different markets. But if you ha like to read, if it's newspapers, or for example, you love to read romances, or you love to read autobiographies, or whatever, whatever you like to read, you can start reading in that language. And if you're, st if you're a, new, a newbie, if you're just starting the language, children's books are awesome. And, and, and websites and apps for children are the best way to do it, if, particularly if you're doing this by yourself. Because they're designed to teach, you know, five and six-year-olds how to read in their own language. So it's, children's books are, and uh, children's materials are great for beginners. And then when you move up into, you know, intermediate, then we're talking, say, middle school-ish. And then after that, you can usually access normal materials for that language. So these, and often those things, not only are they cheap or free, but they're also much more interesting uh, than doing it um, other ways. So for example, if you wanted to learn Chinese characters or one of the writing systems, you've got apps that allow you to practice doing them on your tablet. And then giving, f you know, it gives you, the, the, the app gives you feedback on your, on your characters. Um, I mentioned video games. I'm not sure if there are many gamers. Any, any gamers in the? Audience? Okay. Uh, there's actually been research done, perhaps not surprisingly in Scandinavia, that taking part in multiplayer games is actually a really good way to practice and develop your English. Because within the game, it's real. You need to communicate with your partners. You need to be able to get the information out there. And the context is, you know, otherwise your character will get killed off, therefore there's motivation. So. Obviously not a huge vocabulary, but if you're doing, if, if this is something, like if you're not a gamer, I wouldn't suggest using that to learn because that's not quite what you like to do. But whatever it is that you're, you enjoy doing, you, you want to try to add some language aspect uh, into that. And of course, the issue of the most appropriate device to learning tasks. As I mentioned, phones are great because you have them with you. And depending on the Wi-Fi <laughs> available, um, you know, you can have access to all kinds of different things, but mostly it's because it's with you all the time. La and of, cor of course, for a lot of you, um, tablets, iPads, tablets are great, particularly also as we get older because trying to read on a phone is difficult, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, so tablets are great for reading for long time, for reading for long periods of time, and for example, watching videos. There is research that shows watching Movies with subtitles is actually a good way to learn a language. And so watching a movie in your target language or the English version with the target language subtitles does help people learn. Quick back point. One of the reasons it took us a long time to figure this out was that most of the research on language learning was done with college students and usually university or college students in the US or Canada learning a language at school. So the methods, we didn't really look, because it's, it's much easier to do research on that group because they're a captive audience, effectively. Um, so there wasn't as much research on people, how people learn by themselves. Now there's more research on how people can learn by themselves. So these are ways that you can do it. Um, and again, it depends on your timeline. If you're just doing it for fun, you, you're doing a little bit every day. If you have a deadline, then you can sort of, you know, accelerate your learning towards that. Um, and, you know, I think most of us would agree if you had to write, a, write much, uh, a desktop or a laptop is better. As I said, I'm sure now there are people who've written essays on mobile phones, but they're probably 20 or 30 years younger than most of us. Um, 
so it's about appropriate, there's not one right technology, it's about choosing the appropriate technology. So again, depending on your, on your, your reading vision these days, you know, um, tablet versus phone. Um, of course, you can put in headsets and you can listen. So a lot of people like listening to audiobooks. So you can listen to the audiobook in the target language. And because you're not being tested on it, here's the great thing about learning languages later in life. You're not being tested. For a lot of people, the stress was about the grades. You know, oh my God, I didn't hear, you know, what if I don't get this, what? Nobody other than yourself cares. <laughs> so when you take away the the evaluation aspect, it's learning for fun. For a lot of people, that's a weird concept, but that's, if you, there's, no exa there's no exams unless you want to do exams. If you like doing tests, and there are some people who like doing tests, you, you know, the tests that are embedded in these things don't grade. They give you a mark, and then you can go back and fix it yourself. So this is the nice thing about learning languages now. There's not an evaluation. There's no testing. And if you do it by yourself, then you don't have to worry. Some people worry about making mistakes in front of other people. In this case, it's you and the technology or you and your tutor if you're doing it through, like, you know, doing a tutoring through, through Skype or um, Zoom. Um, it, also go flip back. it also helps you become more autonomous because, of course, this is one of the things I always tell both my, my teachers, because <laughs> I, I teach teachers normally, and the students, is that the thing with language is you're, you're going to be using it in the real world, right? And in the real world, for example, if you don't know a word in English, what do you do? You look it up. So learning to use your technologies, even things like Google Translate or any of these translation programs. How many of you have used Google Translate? Yeah. For those who haven't, um, you probably have it on your device. Google Translate has actually, is actually really quite good. You can speak into it, and it comes out with the other language. You can set it so it does that as well. It, in the old days, it was just reading and texting. Um, reading and writing, but you can actually do it verbally now, which helps because often we, the reason we can't use it is you don't, we don't know how to write the word, right? Um, so I've, I've actually used Google Translate, the, the oral bit, to communicate with various people in various contexts. So you can also play around with that because in the real world, when you go into the context, there will be things you don't understand. So learning how to learn is actually one of the most important things to do for learning anything. Learning strategies that'll help you use and, and become better and more familiar with it. Um, so, okay, yeah, smart, you know, one of the things that's interesting with smartphones that we, a lot of us have forgotten is that for those of you who are you know, retired teachers, the whole AV department is now in your pocket. So you can video. So, for example, you can video yourself saying things it, to give yourself feedback. You can capture interactions on video to use them for learning. You know, one of the things that happens now in dance classes, at the end of the dance, the, uh, the, the instructors will do a, a, uh, you know, do a demonstration of whatever the steps were, and everybody videos it to learn. So you can video or take pictures of signs in the target language. You can video interactions and use them to learn. And of course, it's much more meaningful to you because you've captured that information. And as I said, you can use it to give yourself feedback on what you're doing. Uh, there's even apps that allow that that will use that to help you provide provide feedback on your on your on your accent and things like that. Um, where are my readers? <laughs> of course, for reading, if you love reading, whatever you love reading, you want to try to do it in the in the other language. And I mentioned how books, you know, books and materials for kids are good ones to start with. Of course, you also can have built-in. Uh, translators into into books, into your ebooks, and that can help provide that kind of feedback. So, you know, basically, what do you already do? What do you already enjoy doing? And how can you help use that to help you learn the other language, whatever the target language is? So apps, photos, Facebook. You know, one of the things uh, I'm guessing, are a lot of you still on Facebook? Yeah. Um, so you can also, like, for example, find groups that are learning the language that you're interested in. <laughs> so that gives you that support. Uh, of course, you can also join ones that are of, of your interest in, say, for example, f I know there's, where are my, my crafters? My crafters and knitters. Anybody in here? Um, so, you know, people do, do knitting and crafts all over the world. So you could join a group 
and you know maybe get in contact with people who do that in whatever country or language that you're interested in and then you can sort of interact with them. So the most important thing is figuring out what the most appropriate ta technology for specific learning tasks are and of course all technologies have advantages and limitations as you know one of the challenges we find sometimes on cruise ships is limited bandwidth and that's where those apps on your phone <laughs> are really good because you can still practice. You know, if you have a, a, an app that goes works offline, then you can still practice. And of course, you can still read. And if you've downloaded audiobooks, you can still listen. And of course, the, the some, sometimes a good old dictionary can be helpful because the one problem with technologies is uh, batteries. So some of the things that you can do. So for example, on YouTube, you've got you can you know you can do. L lessons, which can help for, th for those people who like structure, learning from a teacher can really help. I remember one person uh, who was talking about, I was talking to one of the other ships, who is an engineer and found learning language in a natural context really annoying because he knew there were rules out there, but nobody was telling him. So if you like to know what the rule is, then lessons can help with giving with with that particularly if you find the teacher uh, or teachers whose styles work for you and as any of the teachers in the audience would know you know 99% of your students could love you and there will be one who really doesn't because your style just doesn't match them so everybody has a preferred style and you say well what's mine well it's the ones that you like versus the ones that you don't like some people like ones that are class, you know, teachers that are very straightforward and structured. Others prefer, you know, a more friendly approach. It's whatever works for you. And the way, you, again, the way you find that out is you watch one and, you know, if you have like a, oh, I don't like that, then that's not your style. Um, and of course, also, what language do you want to, you know, pri you, you need to sort of prioritize or figure out what types of language do I need to learn first? If you're going to, uh, Lithuania in six months for a, a tra for to tour, you probably need to learn survival Lithuanian. So you would focus on trying to find a course that teaches you, you know, how to go shopping, how to how to order a beer, and for the for the women, uh, where the where's the nearest bathroom? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's that's usually the number one thing we want to know, um, and saying hello and goodbye. So. You don't need to learn everything about Lithuanian. You need to learn those bits initially. Uh, as I mentioned, apps. They, you know, Duolingo, Rosetta Stone, uh, are, are some of them are free and some of them have a minor cost. Uh, Duolingo pretty much has every language you could possibly think about on it. Um, as some of the people who've, who've used it would say, it, it's much better for reading and writing and sometimes for listening. This is true of most apps because Speaking is difficult. Uh, teaching speaking is difficult. Monitoring speaking is difficult, and it's 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 difficult for apps to provide that kind of feedback. Um, also, as I said, you know, if you're, for example, interested in uh, skiing, skiing, skiing websites and podcasts and stuff like that, that's what you should be looking at. You know, so things that are where you're learning stuff, or for example, you're an academic who's studying astrophysicists, astrophysics, <laughs> or astrophysicists, different study. Um, say you're interested in astrophysics, you know, research on that topic. You know, obviously that's a higher level of the, the target language, but the thing is, you're interested in learning the material, therefore, it's useful for you. If you're a plumber, you know, looking at websites that you know, or, or, or videos and stuff like that that teach about plumbing. That's what you're looking at. That's what you should be looking for. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about lifelong learning, and this is not a particularly, you know, this isn't, isn't a hard sell to the people who are in this audience, because obviously you're here because you like to learn. Um, also, I'm aware that most of the people, a lot of people here are baby boomers or Gen X, and particularly for the baby boomers, lifelong learning has been part of your life. The idea of learning throughout life is not a new concept. And of course, the more we study it, the more we realize that learning anything through life is actually good physiologically. You know, the research shows that the more you're cognitively involved, 
the less the, the the less impact dementia, Alzheimer's, all of these things are. We we know that this actually happens. Um, and as a little plug for dance, social dancing, um, when I was in uh, Argentina, there is research done uh, showing that learning tango, Argentinian tango, actually helps people with Parkinson's. And it helps with cognitive awareness. But I mean, for Parkinson's, the Parkinson's stuff is a bit unusual because you just say, well, but it's a balanced thing. So often singing will be a way for people who have dementia to reconnect. But in tango, Argentinian tango, balance is really, really important. So being involved in that actually helps develop in, in that context, some of the, uh, helps overcome some of the, the side effects of uh, Parkinson's. So what is lifelong learning? It's, it's a philosophy rather than a methodology, <laughs> but it's about continuing to learn um, and be keeping engaged in the world. You're never too old to learn something. So, you know, I, I tell people, oh, I would have loved to have done this when I was young. Yeah, the good news is the kids are gone. <laughs> You're retired, now is the time to do it. You're never too old to learn something new. And the only limitation on doing certain things, like skydiving and that one, I mean, that actually there was a woman who did, did recently sky was skydiving on her 99th birthday, and she was going to do it again on her 100th, um, is, is learning how to work around any physical limitations that you may have. So the benefits are cognitive, in other words, in terms of brain health, uh, neurological, in terms of body connection, uh, psychological, obviously, the more engaged that we are, um, the less we tend to have issues with things like depression. And I, I'm not sure for the Aussies, you may have watched the show, uh, you know, the old age home for, for four-year-olds. Yeah, you know, and what that show, what, and, th and there was one recently for, with teenagers, all that show is that one of the challenges for people living in, in, in age care is lack of engagement. In the old days, before age care, they would have been in the house with everybody around. And having the four-year-olds brought everybody back to life because they were being actively engaged. So the other thing about learning, in some cases, is being in a classroom. And in classrooms, you meet people. You know, So for example, uh, because I do dance, different type of Latin dancing, ball or whatever, um, I'll often go to classes, and that's a way to meet people. <laughs> So one of the things about learning something new, whether it's language or a skill, is that it gives you a chance to meet new people. Of course, you know, for a lot of people, that's why you cruise. It's, it's really easy to meet people on cruises and, you know, make lifelong friends. It's, it's a very sort of intense uh, experience. So learning can help you do that as well. Uh, career and professional development, yeah, less so now. You're on the other end of it where you're doing consulting and explaining to people how things work. Um, so improve your self-confidence, brain health, yeah, learning skills, things that you've always wanted. I've always wanted to learn how to learn the piano, learn the guitar, learn whatever. Do it. I mean, it actually benefits your brain as well as your yeah, learning things like uh, keyboarding and get and and str that's actually really good for people who have arthritis in their fingers um, because anything that's doing stuff with your hands helps with the the flexibility and helps develop that might hurt a little uh, initially, um, but anything that you're doing that get e that's getting you to move parts that you don't normally move uh, will usually have benef uh, a benefit afterwards. Uh, oh, of course, you know, talk to your doctors first. So, where are you know, keep educating yourself. <laughs> Education is not a preparation for life; it's life itself. All these little things that we say. Um, so. You know, basically, everybody <laughs> throughout history has said continual learning is useful. Um, again, it's even just, for example, going, like one of the challenges, of course, for a lot of people during, during lockdown was lockdown. They were used to going out. Um, and, of course, it was, uh, I, on, on the other hand, it was sort of interesting. In, you know, suddenly everybody started walking the dogs. The dogs got very tired because walking the dog was the only thing you could do. Uh, so ironically, some people who are usually always at home, suddenly they, they started to go out again. Um, but you know that challenge is something that of course is mirrored, particularly for a lot of older people, is, is, is keeping that engagement. And sometimes having a place to go, you know, I mentioned the men's sheds the other day, helps with the, the physical contact, the psychological contact, that 
dancing, by the way, is really good also just for physical contact, because the older you go, uh, older you get, particularly if, you, if you're if you're not partnered anymore, there's just there's very little opportunity for contact with other people. So dancing is a is a good way to sort of uh, address that. Uh, gives you an emotional boost because you know you're learning, you're accomplishing. Um, Again, a great way to meet new people and people who are interested. Like one of the things the internet has told us, has shown us, is that for whatever weird interest you have, there are other people out there who have it too. <laughs> um, so you know, find your tribe, as they say. Find the people who like. And of course, everybody has multiple tribes. You might have your your knitting crowd. You might have your bridge crowd. You know, like you do on the ship, basically. Um, and when you get home, one of the things, of course, is when you get home. You lose that. Well, you don't need to lose that. F get in contact. I mean, with Zoom, as I said, nowadays you can, you know, Zoom allows you to be in the same room with all these people um, on an ongoing basis. Um, and again, you've got the time. That's the other, the other aspect of this. Uh, again, th now there's different ways to do this. Um, Road Scholar talk about in a minute. Uh, enrichment programs, teaching to learn. Volunteer. Um, I went to Bali in 2000 uh, in, in, in 2017 as a member of the Australian Volunteers for International Development, which is an Australian government uh, program. So I went there as a hospitality trainer. Oh, that was technically the term. Um, in fact, I was working with a college called Mediterranean Bali College that trains people for the cruise industry, food and beverage, housekeeping. And because of my background as an academic, um, I basically should like help them rewrite the right or their curriculum and stuff like that. But this is a you know a way to sort of give back. One of the things you all have from your experience, whatever that experience is, is a lot of knowledge that can be passed on to other people, and that can be done as a consultant to make some money, or in volunteer positions um, in in programs like that. If you like to learn rather than to teach. Uh, there's a number of programs for doing that as well. I, as I mentioned, learning doesn't have to happen in the classroom, and so that's, you know, for a lot of people, that's the reason why they stop learning. Now, any of you get involved in studying online during lockdown? Um, I discovered Future Learn and did about 40 courses. Uh, quick note, most of them are short courses. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't long courses, uh, but they were free. So these uh, online, massive, massive online MOOC programs, basically you can study, so you've always wanted to lear, study archaeology, you can for free. Usually you have to pay if you want a certificate. So as you can see by the, the these are some of the, some of the, the MOOCs that are available. Um, Coursera, if, you, if you've been watching television on in your cabin, uh, Coursera actually advertises quite a bit in the, on the US uh, channels. Uh, but yeah, basically these are university courses Sometimes they're very short, sometimes they're long, and you can do them for free, which is what, for a lot of you, it's just learning. You want to learn. If you want to get the piece of paper, then you usually pay, sometimes it's a, a relatively small fee. So this is the, the course for a site, and you can see there's free courses. Um, there are specific types of ones if you want to get a certificate in something. That's the home page for it. And you can see you know, the universities, uh, Stanford, San Diego, Duke, they also have a number of uh, Australian ones as well. Um, this is another one, uh, edX. And you can see th these tend to be, uh, so uh, MIT, Harvard, UC Berkeley, Hong Kong Polytech, uh, UBC. And some of these ones specialize more on, say, tech ones, but a lot of them have just general courses. Somebody was asking me about, or was telling me, oh, that's right, when I was in the airport in, um, in San Francisco waiting to fly to um, Auckland to join this ship, I had a long, ended up having a long conversation with this, this person um, who was, was learning um, I uh, uh, Irish, Celtic Irish, Irish Gaelic, sorry, Irish Gaelic, because he liked singing, he played guitar and he wanted to sing those songs. And I was mentioning that Future Learn has a course in uh, Irish Gaelic. So again, so Future Learn, this is the one that I was using. Um, basically, again, you can pretty much learn anything. I was interested at that time on, on a lot of the, the stuff around uh, COVID, so COVID prevention, uh, keeping up on on what on the virus developments, but also things like I did some stuff on uh, you know setting up a business. Uh, analytics, big data, 
There's a few TAFE courses, uh, which is a community college for the non-Australians, um, around you know food prep and all that sort of stuff. And again, with these ones, some of them have uh, have built-in evaluations, some of them don't. But they're fun, you know, fun, and some of them have audio, so some of them will have videos, some of them will have reading, some of them will have a mix of them, some have assignments, some don't have assignments. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, and you, again, just, you know, play around with learning whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, this is another one, again, <laughs> particularly if you're interested in video. So what is a MOOC? It's a massive open online course. And those were started, a lot of those started in the mid-2010s. Uh, Part of the idea was to be able to educate the world. So the idea with MOOCs is that, you know, if you have somebody in a small town in India, they can, st they can still get, credit, uh, get an accreditation that will help them in their, in their community. Or in Africa, learning about, uh, you know, creating fresh water technologies and things like that. So a, a big part of the original MOOC focus was actually uh, philanthropic. And it still has that, that benefit that people, you know, as I said, a lot of you have learned things through YouTube. Um, a lot of people have, have, I mean, what they need is the knowledge. They don't need the piece of paper. They need to learn how to engineer. They need, ha you know, there are some people, for example, they've created, uh, you know, being able to create uh, artificial hands using uh, the, the new printers, 3D printers, and providing that material, that information, so that anybody who has access to one can, can do it. Um, Road Scholar is a program, it used to be called the Elder Hostel program, some of you may be familiar with that. Um, and I was actually talking to somebody on one of the ships who's been on it, so it still exists. Basically, these are, are sort of gap year courses <laughs> for people uh, older than gap year. How's that? Uh, they're originally sort of 50, 55 plus, which is an age range that I find slightly, anyway. Um, so the thing with Road Scholar is basically you're going on uh, a curated tour with, uh, in the old days, you, you would stay in, for example, university residences and do classes at universities. Uh, the person I was talking to says they don't really do that anymore. But small group tours with expert uh, teachers on, so you're in Egypt and you're meeting with the archeologists that are doing the digs and things like that. So the focus with Road Scholar is on learning stuff. But again, learning stuff without evaluation. So the thing with, with Road Scholar if they, is they've been, do, they've been working with seniors since 75. So what that means is they're well aware of potential you know, physical limitations that come with age, but the types of things that people do and don't want to do, um, and creating learning experience or, or, or cultural experiences uh, with that in mind. The other thing you can do is you don't need to be a teen, uh, you know, a teenager to do a gap year. You can do a gap year near now. So when you see things like study abroad programs, this is actually a good way to stay in a country for a number of years or a number of months. Because if you're on a student visa, you can often stay for six months in a place. So, you know, often, uh, say for Australia, you, you know, one month or two months. But if you're a, on a student visa, you can actually stay for quite a long time. And the trick, of course, then, is to find a, a school context that works for you. And sometimes you get language, like language schools are often run as, as private businesses. So as I mentioned, the one when I, in Argentina that I was doing, it was, you know, classes in the morning, tango in the afternoon. And you can do that for quite a long time. Now, this is the program that I did in Bali. And for the non-Australians, the, these programs do exist in other countries, Canada, the US. I'm not that familiar with how those work. But so this is the Australian one. And basically any Australian citizen can, can apply for this. And they are looking, or they certainly were pre-COVID, looking for people from all different age groups. When I went, uh, there was a gentleman who was probably in his 70s um, who went to Jakarta and was working with Cricket Indonesia. Um, there was another person who was working, who was working with one of the NGOs in, like I, I was in Bali, I was in, in Sanur, but there were volunteers all over Indonesia. And basically this program, it's done through the DFAT and it, it places people throughout the Indo-Pacific. So, you know, Fiji, um, 
Tonga, all of this, and they're starting up again in terms of, uh, sometimes they're three-month gigs, sometimes they're six-month gigs. If you go in-country, they provide a stipend um, and travel and, and things like that. They also, right now, still have online uh, programs, so you can volunteer to help. Uh, they, they have, you know, communications, business, particularly people for, for backgrounds in healthcare, and it's about training local people in, in those areas. Okay, and that's me. Um, hey, good timing. So if you want to find me, these are references to do that. And thank you so very, very much for all coming to my talks.